Welcome. I'm Bob. I'm the keeper of the machines. We've got a machine one in right now. It's very loud. If you need to hear me, I can speak up. Just let me know. We also have another machine one in, which you probably have not noticed because it does not make any noise. This is the maker space. We've got the two 3D printers, and right over in the back, we have a CAD CAM machine, a mill. Which, if you want to use that, you gotta ask me and pray that I can even get it to work. That guy and this guy, you are free to use as long as I'm around. We do have MakerBot also in Cranford. So, to start this, we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about the 3D printers and the technology. The classifications of machines is additive ma manufacturing. That's the fancy term for 3D printing. Now, it seems like it's brand new technology. It is not. This guy has been around since the 80s. That guy, late 80s, early 90s. The, the thing with these machines is they are getting more prominent because the technology is getting better. They started with this guy, which is the stereolithography. It's SLA, stereolithography apparatus. They use a liquid resin and a laser. It's mostly a UV light. It cures the resin, makes it solid, and it pulls up. The base pulls up, keeping it stuck to the base. It cures the bottom, and it keeps pulling up. So eventually, this guy would come all the way up, and you'll see a device underneath it. These guys are not traditionally entry level in pricing. This guy is about 3500 They've retired this model and they've gone to a newer model, which is still around 3500 maybe around 45 That's 4500 So not traditionally going to be seen inside someone's house, unless you happen to have a lot of money to spend. But they are used in a lot of businesses for prototyping. The models are quite sturdy, quite smooth, require a little bit of finishing. And it is quite good to walk next to. What came after them, I don't have in this room, and we don't have one in this school, because we do not have $200,000 to spend, would be your SLS, your Selective Laser Sintorin, which is a fancy term for melting. Sintorin is just a smidge under melting point. Uses a very high-powered laser, typically in the hundreds and even thousands of watts. They are your manufacturing machines. They use a, instead of using liquid, they use a powder. And the powder can be anything from a plastic, a nylon, ceramic, all the way up to metals, such as aluminum, iron, steel. When you start talking about the metal printers, you get out the SLS into the SLM, which is let the laser melt in. It's a much higher melt in, it's a much higher power laser. Those are the ones that get into the thousands of blocks. And you're looking at 200,000 up to a cool million for those puntos. We uh, do not have one of those. We have the baby brother to that technology, which is the Color Jet Quinton, which is made by a um, company, uh, 3D Systems. It again uses a powder. In the case of the punto we have, it's a gypsum. They take dry wall, they grind it up. And instead of a laser, it uses a glue. And it just deposits the glue on the top layer of powder, puts another layer on top of it, glues that, puts another layer, and just keeps going until it gets a model. 
they are not very strong models. But they can be made stronger with the infiltrates. You can put water on them, you can wax them, you can put resin on them, a two part of epoxy type stuff. And you can super glue them, which I do not recommend for health and safety purposes. It gets quite hot. Super glue is a very exothermic reaction. The thing with the cuddle jet printers is they can do cuddle. Most of the other printers, they are generally just a model call. Some of them get fancy, but it's when you're talking maker bot, they put two scooter heads in and it's a bicuddle, bichromatic mostly. The cuddle jets are generally full cuddle. And the one that we have in Cranford can do that. They can put full cuddle models. After that, there was the resurgence of 3D printing in the late 80s, early 90s, which is the FDMs, the fused deposition modeling, which also can be called fused filament, uh, fused filament, uh, Fabrication, FFF. I never use that call. Too many Fs. The fused deposition model or your maker box. Their main thing is they are cheap. You can find those guys for roughly 500 bucks at the cheapest end. At the high end, you know, five, six thousand maybe even up to 10,000. Mostly when they get up that high, it's how big of an object you can build. The MakerBot is in the mid-range, uh, $3,000, 4,500. You used to be able to walk into Home Depot and pick one up. And they probably were selling smaller ones for around 1,200. You can get them relatively cheap if you're willing to put in the walk. This guy was about $750, $750. Only catch was you had to build it yourself. And you had to hope and pray that the company sent you the correct parts. If they didn't send you the correct parts, they would yell at you, tell you it was fine. I generally don't recommend it. And it generally doesn't work. But it was a kit that you had to put together, so there was a bit of a learning curve to get something to actually come out of it. The MakerBot, it sips all in one piece, and it's a glorified glue gun. It's how they work is the extruder just pulls a piece of filament through, which is where the FFF comes into play. It's just a piece of plastic, it gets extruded through, it's on a XY carriage, so it moves in the X and Y. And it's on a platform that moves in the Z axis. So it just comes down, it makes contact, it goes through its tool path in, and then drops a little bit and goes again. They are big among hobbyists because of their price point. And people can, you can buy the extruder heads just separately, and a lot of people will build their own 3D printers. They just need uh, three models and some way to control them. So they're big on the hobbyists. Uh, I am not impressed with the quality of the, of the work that comes out of them. They are, they are in use for quite heavily in industry, because the parts are quite functional, you're not going to be a um, manufacturer and stuff and selling them, but they do make decent prototype parts that you can actually physically do stuff with. They are, it is quite good for when you need to replace parts. We have the mi a microscope here. It has a non-standard um, attachment for a webcam which is not generally good when you have to buy something for it, because they generally will charge you an arm and a leg. 
So the beauty of the MakerBot and other 3D printers, if this guy goes on this to me, is you can take a very cheap webcam, got it for free. The professor probably had paid probably 120 bucks for it, probably about 10 years ago. I ripped it apart and I printed out an adapter. I had to do some extra modifications to actually get it to work with this guy. Take a look at that and see the quality of the warp that comes out of the machine. Just today, I printed some stuff from the online class. Just turn over those guys and compress those around. Don't steal them, I need those back. I have a few other projects printed in from the class. And then you can print little doodads out of it. These uh, I had printed out as a giveaway for the college, little earbud totals. Up in the back, you know, I've got this came from that cuddle jet printer. I actually didn't do it in cuddle. You can feel a difference in this. This is the powder printer. And this is actually not printed all as one assembly. This actually is multiple piece assembly that I put together. Everything comes off. So just have to be careful with this guy. It breaks easily. But you can definitely feel when you hold that guy, you can feel a difference. It's more chalky than other than things. I don't have anything with that guy currently. He's been a thorn in my side. It turns out that the resin has an expiration date. I did not know that. And it's been giving me some trouble because I've, asked, I've uh, probably have ruined the uh, one piece of equipment in it, the point tray. But that all is good. It's, if we were able to buy stuff or to buy stuff. I have software loaded. Each printer has its own software. You've got the Form 1 uses this thing called Preform. And the beauty with all these 3D printers is they all use the same file type. They all use the same file type. It's been around since the 80s, so we're pushing 40, almost 40 years now, called STL. Every 3D printer uses an STL file. It's just, everyone uses it. It's a monochrome program. It's a monochrome piece of um, pro, um, software, biotype. Most printers are monochrome, so it's never a big deal. Some of them do use the um, OBJ and everything, which is your, which you can do color with. And some printers can do color, mostly the color jet printers. So there, there is a new printer out, $200,000, that uses a gel to make it stuff, and it actually dyes the gel as it prints. $200,000, so if anyone wants to donate a print goal, you just need $200,000. It'd be a huge boom to this place. All the software is pretty easy to use. This is the preform for the Form 1. It actually does everything for you. It's got a uh, quick tool. Click, it handles everything for you. The tough part when using any of these softwares is getting the STL file. Inventor is a 
is a boon for this because it will take your IPT file and it will create your IPT for you. Up in file, you can go export and CAD format. Save as type, you can save it as an STL. You go to options, and you want to make sure that the units are set up to what you have actually drawn it as. It gives you a bunch of options. If you don't know what you drew it as, you can just select source units, which will use whatever the base is, inches, millimeters, feet, whatever. Nothing else needs to be touched. save it. And you can just open your newly saved file. Most of these programs are metric based. They all come in as millimeters. So the part that I just brought in was actually inches, and it's actually about 10 inches, which is way outside the scope of the project the online people were told to use. They were told it had to fit into a two, a two by two by two cube. But in the software, you can actually change what the units are. So I can change that to uh, inches and we can see it's not gonna fit. box software, they actually have two pieces of software. And I should mention, this is a, a plug for the ALC in Cranford. If you have a, a, if you have a file you want to print, you can either come here to see me and I can get you printed. You can go to Cranford where there's numerous people that can help you with the physics lab, room N11. Or you can go to the a ALC in Cranford. They have two maker box. With luck, someone there will be able to help you. I'm not allowed to touch them. But they should have a couple of tutors that know how to use them and can get you printed on them. They, at last I heard, they only have one color. And I think it's a bright orange. Here and in the physics lab, you, we have many colors. You pick a color, I can tell you if we have it. We have a lot of different colors. Though so you are limited to one color. Unless you feel like hanging around and waiting to swap out filament. The only way to get multi colors with, that, with these guys is to actually pause it Remove the filament, put a new filament in. And even and at that point it's just going to be stacked on top. Which isn't too bad if you have the patience. You can't actually stop the print draw and you can't have it stop at a certain point, which would have been nice. But the two pieces of software we have on these computers over the entire school. We've got the MakerBot desktop. It is no longer being supported. They've updated their software. And it will take STL files. So 
we can bring in our Super Bigfoot. Again, it comes in as millimeters. You can rescale it by double clicking on the bottom guy. It's got a inches to millimeter button. So it'll as we scale it up. And you can always go into the things and you can change it if you know what you want it to be and if you want to put something out smaller, which is always recommended for first time footage. And you can move these guys around the bed. You always want to try to do things flat. So it's right on the bottom. If you don't, nothing bad will happen, but you'll be looking at a, what should be a two or three hour point, you're going into an 18 hour point. I've got those three guys over there. It is, I think, estimated at about four hours of footage. And the only about, the, the biggest point is two inches high. And it's a, pair of, it's a pair of glasses. And that's about four hours. So they're called rapid prototyping because they take hours instead of weeks. Because if you wanted to actually do a prototype, and traditional methods, you'd have to actually outsource everything. They'd have to make molds, cast things. It takes weeks. These guys take hours, sometimes days. This is the software we have on now, and it's got... You can rotate the parts move them around, resize. These are software that you kind of have to just get your hands on and play with. They have new software, which is the MakerBot print, which just came out probably a couple months ago. I only know about because the software, the other software stopped working, which is pretty common from this company. It has one big advantage over the old MakerBot software. If I go to insert file, it will actually take an IPT file. I can actually import an IPT file. So I can take one of the points. And it actually does know what the units are. Because somewhere in the STL file, it does actually have what the units are. Most programs just don't seem to look at it. The big problem though is when you actually try to rescale stuff, it's all in millimeters. Which can be fixed, you just have to go through a whole bunch of settings. And it does include a nice photo of lanes. Rotation, you can rotate the things. Resize. MakerBot does come with a camera and it is Wi-Fi connected. So you can actually check to see what's actually going on. So this guy is showing me what's happening. And it's telling me it's got three hours remaining. things with 
the Mega Mart is nothing is supported. The model is not supported. So if you have something like this, where it's a nice flat piece, it prints fine. It prints, prints perfect. If you've got something that is not flat and is an oddball geometry, this guy would not print on there. Not unless you added support structs on it would have it would have to add pieces in between so it has something to put the film in on when it prints. It's got to add support structure. The software takes care of that. It does that all for you. You don't have to worry about it. The big problem is it's a pain to get off. It is very difficult to get the support structure off. And even when you do get it off, it leaves remain remnants behind, which you'd have to take a Dremel or sandpaper to. So, if you're doing something incredibly complicated, sometimes it's better to add your own support structure, make it a little bit easier to get off. But 3D printing can do very complex geometry. This would actually be almost impossible doing regular woodworking, milling machines. You could probably mold this, but you're looking at making a mold that's put together, blow it out. You wouldn't be able to carve this. On that subject, there is GE Aviation from Jeep General Electric. They, I just looked it up just recently. I wanted to see how they were doing. Uh, back in 2012, I think they uh, bought out a, they bought a couple of companies, a couple of 3D printing companies, and they started to manufacture aircraft parts. They started with a fuel injector. Very small, tiny part, incredibly complex. Would take months for them to get one prototype of these guys. They'd have to form them out, they'd have to get many different molds, assemble them. It was a hassle. They bought a couple companies, they invested in a bunch of SLS printers. They are currently, as of 2016, they got FDA approval to put them in aircrafts. They are testing them, they, are, they have them in airplanes, with just in normal commercial planes, upgrading everything. They are costing them a fraction of what they used to cost. Because instead of having to go to many different companies and hire someone to actually sit down and screw these guys together, they put them into a printer and they print out 10, 30 of them at a time. They just, because the, with the SLS, because it's all powder, you don't have to support it. So you can put one down on the bottom of it and these things can go 10, 12 inches deep. So you have a part like this, you put one down, 